I'm a quantitative research scientist with the Evaluation Sciences Unit who is helping organize the SMCI seminar series. Um, and I am pleased to welcome Jake Mickelson and Tracy O oh to present today. Uh, they had an exciting presentation that I've heard a lot about at the recent Lean conference, and I'm excited to learn more. Uh, but before I get started with introductions, uh, one announcement and reminder is uh, the SMCI is accepting submissions for the third annual Improvement Publication Award uh, to celebrate in publications in improvement in Stanford, our affiliates and partners. Uh, the link to the submission form is now in the chat, uh, but please uh, email Lisa or I if you have any questions at all. Um, and I think that's the main announcement. We're hoping all submissions are in by November 21st. So there's a little time, but we're excited to see your papers. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so today I would like to welcome Jake and Tracy to SMCI seminar series. Jake Mickelson is a certified improvement practitioner with experience in building healthcare improvement capacity across the globe. His improvement teaching and coaching have served uh, major institutions such as Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of Kansas Medical Center, uh, the All India Institute for Medical Sciences in New Delhi, and AIC. Uh, Kajabi Hospital in Kenya. Uh, these experience have, uh, he has coached hundreds of healthcare improvement professionals and co-authored co dozens of articles. Um, outside Stanford Healthcare, he is also a faculty fellow in the Stanford Center for Innovation and Global Health. Uh, Tracy is a registered nurse and certified professional in healthcare quality. She is experienced in guiding coaching uh, nursing leaders through quality improvement initiatives from the unit to the hospital at Stanford Healthcare. Tracy has uh, clinical nurse expertise in adult medicine and oncology and is currently in the ACES cohort three, which is currently ongoing. Uh, she earned her master's in healthcare administration and interprofessional leadership from UCSF, and she is passionate about improving systems to prevent patient falls in the hospital and leverage meaningful data to drive uh, change. So welcome to you both to the seminar series, um, and I will hand it over to uh, whoever is starting your presentation. Thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs> Thanks Jake, for sharing the screen there. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I appreciate um, Jake and his engagement with me to present this information and um, to have a discussion with you today. Um, we do really enjoy interactivity, so happy to see some emoji use. Um, we will be asking some questions um, to, so please Invite, inviting you to put your comments in the chat. Okay, let's go on to our next slide. So one of the reasons, the reason we wanted to talk to you today is that we want to acknowledge that the complexity of our healthcare environments from our small clinics to our multi-hospital systems combined with our human tendency to gravitate towards seeming, the seemingly simple and our human drive for a quick payoff um, and results that leads to fast paced and frequent changes that do not sustain over time. And ultimately no sustained improvement for our patients or our healthcare worker outcomes. And so we propose that to break out of this seemingly inevitable equation and cycle, true improvement capability has to be built into our healthcare systems and organizations. So what does that mean when we're talking about building um, improvement capability? Um, you know, flowers that, or is it that we want flowers that we plant that last only one season? Or are we looking for buildings that last decades? So thinking about the layers of our Earth's crust, we plant flowers and crops in the first layers of soil. When we get that and we harvest it, <laughs> it's gone for the next 
season. Um, and, but if we wanted to build a foundation for a complex skyscraper, for example, we have to root down into the bedrock to ensure that our building lasts decades and doesn't crumble when natural disasters hit or some maintenance is missed. You know, if that skyscraper is our healthcare system, what might make it crumble if it's not firmly embedded in the bedrock? Maybe new residents, staff turnover, new leadership, focusing on succeeding at surveys, a pandemic, you know, just that constant firefighting. So today what we want to talk to you about is what is that bedrock actually composed of? So this presentation is a long time in the making, guys, about five years. Yeah, took us that long for Tracy and I to finally get our thoughts together. But this is about five years ago, we pulled together a group of about 40 improvement professionals, clinical and non-clinical. They summed up to be of over 200 years of improvement experience in the healthcare setting. And we asked them the one question, and we just talked about this among the group. You walk into an area in a hospital, how do you know if that area is improvement capable? Picture yourself walking into a new unit, clinic, operational area. How do you know if that area is improvement capable? So pulling together this group of people, we reviewed a number of articles. There's so much about this online, um, about improvement capability. I mean, we're talking about in Australia, we're talking about the UK, we're talking about, um, this is University of Southern California. Uh, we've got IHI, all these things about what does it look like to build improvement capability. So in, in reviewing these articles and talking about our own experiences, uh, we also decided to look at what about books? What are books saying about be, being improvement capable? There's a neat book published in 2004 called If Disney Ran Your Hospital. And it said to change culture, first change structure and hold the people accountable to it. So if you want a culture change where it feels improvement capable in your area, you first got to think about the structures you have. When people return to the same work environment with the same management structures in place, the same attitudes and behaviors will not change. The Oz Principle, which came out in 1994, talked about accountability being a personal choice to rise above one's circumstances and demonstrate ownership necessary for results. If you want to hold people accountable to improve, they have to be able to see the problems, own them, have the knowledge to solve them, and the support to do them. All four have to exist. Atomic Habits, a, more, a very popular book right now, when trying to make change to legacy environments, remember, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, we can't just set the goal. We want to be in an improvement environment. We want everyone to improve. No, you can't. You've got to address your systems. And, and then the last book here, The Culture Code, counsel regarding choosing measures. If you want to pre create an environment where improvement can occur, creating engagement around a simple set of priorities can be a lighthouse. Orienting behaviors and providing a path. All right. All these articles, all these books, 200 plus years of experience and improvement in healthcare. What does an area need? What do we look for? to know an area is an improvement capable. Well, this is what we came up with. And we've tested it over the past five years. So we call it improvement bedrock, 12 tenants necessary to be truly improvement capable. Yep, guys, there's 12. It's not three or four, there's 12. But we're gonna talk about them. First, the area has got to have aligned leadership and shared accountability, broken down in three areas. Operational and clinical leaders are chosen to oversee the planning of improvement efforts. That's got to exist. Leaders create annual plans and follow-up meetings to review progress, and incentives are aligned to motivate and support projects effectively. Those are the first three. The next three are all around improvement science training. Intentional application of chosen improvement methods is ensured by leadership. Training is available to increase the knowledge of skills of those engaged in improvement. And then a frontline structure exists to support the frontline in doing initiatives. The third domain is measure-driven priorities. Measures are chosen to prioritize improvement efforts and include comparative benchmarks. Data sources and measurement tools are accessible. And a cadence meeting exists to review measures and start stop projects where appropriate. That has to be there. 
is part of the bedrock. And then the last three, recognition and reflection. Benefits of improvement work are deliberately calculated and shared. Individuals and teams who realize improvement are recognized and outcomes are celebrated. And then appropriate reflection occurs before we start another bunch of projects. So these are the 12 tenets, but guys, what is a model without some evidence? We're gonna share with you some evidence on why these things exist and where and why they're so important and what we've seen over the past many years as we've watched this. So let's go look at this. Thanks, Jake. So to dive into the first category that there is the tenets one through three, where is assigned leadership and shared accountability. We have to start with identifying uh, leaders to oversee the improvement. You know, in our healthcare system, it's really important to identify both the clinical practice leader and then also the operational leader who can be um, supportive of how to activate your innovations or your improvement work. We have to, of course, be aware of the everyone is responsible trap and the consensus by committee vortex. I think those are really huge um, red flags for us to identify and shift as needed. Number two, those leaders, they create an environment of transparency for the work and how it all fits together. It's important to, of course, define a priority rubric, know the team's actual capacity and resources, so that those leaders can make hard decisions based on priority and capacity, especially around starting, stopping, or continuing work. Our institutional incentives must be intentional and motivating. And I think, you know, we often identify incentives as financial capital, but I think it's really also important to recognize the human side of project teams. Um, that we are human beings and we're not all motivated just by financial incentives. There's recognition, there's time, there's the emotional investment, there's the morality or feeling of obligation, and there's, you know, desire for personal enrichment. Really important to identify those and design your team and your project around that as well. So in this picture, what you see is a picture of Dragon Boat Racing. Really prominent is that drummer on the back. Someone has to be chosen to beat the drum and to direct the boat. The drummer helps the team to know, the rowers, to know when to speed up their paddling, or do their improvement work, when to slow it down, when to start, and when to stop so they don't crash into anything. Here at Stanford, we struggled with sustaining improvements in preventing hospital-acquired pressure injuries. We, many units were struggling. They were each doing their own work um, and creating a lot of variation. And it wasn't until we created a position and hired a person accountable for reducing pressure injuries that we were able to reduce our incidence of pressure injuries by two thirds. And I'm not saying that, you know, create a position, hire an FTE, <laughs> make a whole team necessarily, but just that the importance of having a leader to beat that drum, to direct the boat, to be deliberate um, in, the, uh, in the application of your improvement work is really key. Uh, the next one we talked about is this improvement science training. There's, so about four years ago, a group of physicians in India reached out to Stanford and said, hey, we've got some leaders in place. So they had tenant one. We've got, we've got some incentives ready to go. We're ready to set up a program to improve the cancer experience in India. And so we responded saying, okay, well, it sounds like you're ready for some improvement science training. That's the next step. That's tenants four through six here. And so we introduced them some methods of improvement science training to these, to these group of leaders in India who represented the National Cancer Grid. And they, uh, they ended up choosing A3 problem solving. Um, they adopted it and it's now been spread across 45 centers in India are all using a shared method, an intentional method to improve the cancer experience for patients and families in India. And now they're working on number six creating local improvement structures for supporting their frontline. And what I mean by that is in each of these centers, 
And over these past four years now, about 50% of these 45 are investing in local leaders to create local hubs in their centers to direct improvement science and how it's applied in their healthcare setting. So it was the next step. They had leaders in place. They then went to improvement science training, and now it's being and now it's being applied across the country uh, to to further build their improvement capability. The next one, set ten and seven through nine, we now talk about measures. So. What we're getting at here is that if you walk into the area, they have leaders in place, they have improvement science training available, they're probably ready for some measures. Measures chosen to prioritize their efforts and even a cadence meeting to start, stop projects, review how we're doing towards those measures. Our department here at Stanford, ENT, started this, uh, I think it's been about four years, three or four years, and they have it, they call it their Quality Improvement Council. Um, just one hour virtual every few months, and they do this. This is the agenda of their meeting. They review the measures from their balanced scorecard, and they got nursing, ops, and physician leaders there. They review their project portfolio. Here are the projects we have going on right now, and they just do it on Zoom. They hop on and do this, and I was talking to one of the physician leaders about this meeting, how it's done for ENT. I couldn't believe what he, I heard him say. He said, Jake, it's my favorite meeting I go to as a physician leader. First off, no one really likes meetings, but to have a favorite one made me really happy to hear that. And then um, what's e even more interesting to note about this department, ENT just ranked number one on US News and World Report this year um, for their specialty. Now, we know a lot goes into the US News and World Report ranking, and it's not just this, but uh, having a meeting where they can discuss projects, decide what stops, what starts, who's resourcing what, definitely has contributed to the ranking. Another department I would be remiss to not mention is, is OBGYN. They followed a similar structure. And just in case there's someone from OBGYN on, on the call from Stanford, uh, and they've seen some similar results under the direction of their chair, Leslie Subak. They've done number seven, they've established measures, and they've done number nine. They've got this cadence meeting and it happens every few months. And they make sure the right people are there to say, here's what projects are going on. Here's where we start, here's where we stop. It's key to improvement capability. So here you have a photo from our primary care areas. Um, primary care areas hold improvement recognition events every 10 weeks. The executive director you see here on the left is recognize, uh, recognizing a medical assistant for an improvement project that he led for his local clinic. That project took just eight weeks. The MA presented it to a group of leaders at this event. He calculated the impact of his efforts and found that he increased the number of patients screened and counseled for tobacco cessation by 40 patients in eight weeks. So yeah, calculating your benefits and recognizing those wins really needs to happen in our key components of our improvement bedrock. It's important to make that good that business case in terms of hours, cost, time saved, and definitely important to recognize the people that have done the improvement work. You know, they've done it by being vulnerable, putting sometimes often putting in extra time outside of their other work. So failure to recognize this misses our opportunity to encourage continued engagement and also adoption of new changes. One thing I want to add on this slide is, um, Really think about it. how many of you work in an area where you know there's this cadence venue where people will be recognized for improvement work. And that's all it's about. It's not about tearing apart projects or creating new goals. It's just a venue where people will be recognized. I don't see them happening very often, guys. I, I really don't. And I, I, I think it's, Tracy and I chose to highlight primary care because they do it every 10 weeks. It is a venue where people come, leaders come, and do, they just recognize frontline individuals who have completed improvement work. And it's quite impressive. They've seen it happening for so many years now and they just continue to do it. The reflection, we called out tenant number 12 on its own because it's a step that is more important than I think many of our very fast paced environments really appreciates. I like this quote from John Dewey, a philosopher on theory of knowledge and inquiry. 
We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. And I think reflection can really take place as a really quick and easy exercise. We have some quick examples here. Keep, drop, or ads. We've already said start, stop, continue. Ask what helped us to move forward and let's continue doing that. And what held us back? How do we stop doing that? Make time for this important tenant and the next improvement project will be better than the last. And we continue to build upon that bedrock. So just how has improvement bedrock impacted some different areas and different people? Just to share some reflections. Speaking about tenants one through six, leadership and measure driven priorities, a physician leader said, they have allowed us to have collaboration across different units and disciplines within our work department and to provide that space to provide accountability to improvement work. Speaking on tenant seven through nine on the improvement science, the training support from a nurse. I think before we didn't realize that as nurses in the unit, we can take the initiative and look for areas that can be improved and can actually take the lead. We now realize there are all kinds of improvements that we can make. I think this is really important, you know, giving that training and support to our clinicians at the bedside who are doing the work every day really sets us up for success in building our next improvement leaders as well. So that's all 12. And a few of examples of why they're all really important. We reviewed all 12 tenants in less than 20 minutes. And so the next question is, why don't we do all of these? Why isn't this just intrinsic and embedded already? So we're inviting you now to enter some thoughts on your experience in the chat. Thank you, TJ. Tradition, that's how we've always done it. TJ, I want you to sing the Fiddler on the Roof song all about tradition. <laughs> that's what that made me think the way you said that. I'm not sure you need to hear this voice singing. <laughs> Don, too busy flying the plane to focus on improving or building it. <laughs> yeah, great. Feeling of competing priorities. Time constraints, lack of champions. Misalignment. New processes that people are not willing to adopt. quick fixes, workarounds. We'll just do this now until we have more time. We'll, we'll just do this now. We'll just hold on. It's just a quick, just for the short term. We'll get to it. Promise. <laughs> right. I want to make a comment on Catherine Lowry's on, on lack of champions. I think that's that's so interesting. That's one of them that comes so quickly to you, Catherine. It's one that comes I see quite often, even in my daily work, even today or this week, or just, and and really that's tenant number one that there are leaders chosen a sign that are gonna say that, that keep the improvement work going or stop it where appropriate. And, um, but it's, it's, it's down on the bedrock and it's, it's gotta be figured out. And in some areas, I find some areas I'm working in, that's what we're working on. Who's gonna be our drummer? <laughs> Who's gonna be that person at the head of the dragon boat saying, guys, this is when we move forward and this is when we don't. And then to Lisa's comment, once there's a drummer, can we identify what are the priorities so they are not competing anymore? So obviously you can all think of many reasons of why these tenants don't exist in your environment. Um, we know they're not as easily applied as they are described. Uh, and we acknowledge that even at, at Stanford, we also have a ways to go to apply to our own organization. And while it's, it is really important for us to reflect on each of these tenants, what Jake and I want to propose is that the primary reason our healthcare systems don't have all of these tenants embedded is because we often misunderstand or underestimate how all of these tenants, all 12 of them actually work together 
interplay and create synergy to enable each other. And they're together key pillars for being truly improvement capable. And we also are, may not be appreciating that the order of implementing these tenants is crucial. It's ordinal, we need to go from one to two, all the way through 12. So what we wanna do here is we, uh, Tracy and I were just like, man, it just seems like a lot. There's 12 tenants here, how do we, how do we apply these? And so before we open it up for Q&A, we wanted to take you through a few cases so you can see exactly how they apply. And so um, as even this week, Tracy and I were talking about what are some cases we could put forward that are happening now in our modern healthcare environment where these tenants need to be applied. So um, let us show you a few. So let's go to case one. A clinical, a clinical department has progressed forward through tenant five. So they have training available on improvement science, but they never completed tenant one, identifying an operational lead to partner with the clinical lead to oversee improvement planning. They decided to move forward and start tenant seven through nine by creating a quality of counsel, a balanced scorecard for their department. What problems, if any, do you foresee? And feel free to speak up, share your thoughts. What problems would you foresee, if any? Jake, this is Don. Yeah, please. In this is um, in looking at this, it almost seems like, um, or it almost seems rather prescriptive. And I don't mean I mean that in a good way. It, it seems like you you need to start with one, two, and then three, and so forth. If you jump around, it creates gaps, and those gaps, you know, either one never get filled, and if they don't get filled, they kind of um, create a vacuum that create difficulties to be successful in the long run. You know, I, I kind of, it, it seems like it's a short term, hey, we can do this, so let's do it. Uh, we don't need that. That's not that important, but let's do that. And I'll bet you any money steps 10, 11, and 12 probably rarely get done if you do it this way. <clears throat> yeah. Let me apply your comments to this case. Let me tell you the rest of the story. What happened with this department? It's just happened just this, this past year. This clinical department did go forward, and you're right, it is, these tenants are almost prescriptive. It's, I mean, it's not quite down to the very detail on how you make it happen, but it's pretty close. And they skipped number one. They had a physician leader. They had improvement science training available. They decided to create their quality of counsel. They got their balanced scorecard. They had these great group of measures they were reviewing. But when they finally met in their quality counsel, this is what happened. There was zero operational attendance. It was just um, physicians at the meeting. And when they talked about the problems they wanted to work on, it was all, we need ops to do this, we need ops to do that. Have we been in that structure? Or maybe the structure in another way, where it's the ops leaders and there's no physician leader involvement or nursing leader involvement, and we need nurses to do that, we need physicians to do that. And their quality of counsel ended up going that way every couple months. And um, just this past few months, they finally, th th there's been this huge focus in the department now to define that operational lead. It's been a hiring focus. It's been a department structure focus. And they, and now this person is now just finally getting hired and they're working towards getting them involved in this structure. But you're right, Don, it, it is ordinal. It is somewhat prescriptive, but the gap was so clear. And it's something we could have foreseen as an improvement professional, knowing these, these bedrock principles. But, um, but instead we let the consequences happen as they did here for many months. It was just an, an unfortunate scenario. I like what Deirdre said in the chat, you know, that this counselor team will maybe really struggle to hold the focus on what they're marking on. Um, those competing priorities may be easier to disrupt and derail their work and they'll lose the momentum that they gained. Yeah, thank you. Let us show you another real case. Case two here, the measures are ready. 
So a nursing unit leader is eager to identify and share new key measures for the team and review them at their monthly staff meetings. So tenants seven through nine. Stay with me here, guys. I want to make sure we can follow this. They're working on tenants seven through nine. Their, their physician diet is in alignment on what has been chosen. Okay. But the leaders are still exploring tenants four through six improvement science training, chosen and accessible improvement methods and tools, and hope to introduce them in the following year. What problems, if any, do you foresee? I'll give you a moment. If you need to read through it again, go ahead. But think about this. What problems, if any, do you foresee? They've selected their measures. They know what they're going to count. They know how to show it. I see in the chat, uh, Catherine says, no one is trained. I think you would be apt to tailor your training to the measures so you're successful regardless of <laughs> how it actually goes. No, but Catherine's spot on. Catherine is spot on. And we do this, guys. We do this to each other. We do it to ourselves. We choose measures and create structures to those measures without any tools or methods to help reach those measures. And so how does the team feel that the leaders now said, okay, guys, we got this balanced scorecard. It's fantastic. It's pretty. It's nice. We've got these chosen measures. And then the team says, great, I want to work towards these measures. And they look to where what, what they're going to use to work towards them, and they don't have anything. No structure to support them, no tools, no aligned, no, no decision on what's the intentional improvement method we're going to use. Um, I remember when I was a uh, quality and safety manager in radiology, I worked very closely with Dr. David Larson, um, who many of you know, and we had this very discussion. We talked about, we're creating a new team. Should we work on measures first? Or should we work on making training available first? And we went back and forth on this quite a bit until we landed on, you know what, training has got to come first. First, people have got to see the support, the methods, the tools, the intentional application of a chosen improvement method by leadership before we're gonna start holding ourselves accountable to measures. And therefore the order of that is important and something we can watch for as improvement professionals. I think something Tracy, I can, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I think something we can relate to, you know, is looking at a nursing unit. They've got beautiful visual, vis walls and all sorts of graphs and measures that they're tracking. Um, but without training um, and without understanding the improvement science behind it, how do they respond to when the numbers, the, the graphs and the line starts going up? How do they respond when it goes down? How are they gonna respond when it just bounces back and forth? Um, you know, I think that's um, really important for to help people be less reactive, to understand what the data is telling them, and also to be very intentional and meaningful about how the data is being used. So question, this is Don again. Um, I'm making an assumption that in your steps uh, one, two, and three, you are identifying <clears throat> projects or you know your essentially your future state your target so that you can also determine a gap you know a knowledge gap between where your staff exist and where they need to be and then you create your training program from that am i correct that that's happening in one two and three no i think maybe a little bit but don't, i don't i don't think it needs to be that specific if you're in one two and three what we've seen it's more about choosing and designating a balanced group of individuals who can oversee when improving it starts and stops or how it's resourced. The measures part, it does come later. I, I, I'd almost be hesitant to go too far into the measures without improvement training being available again. Um, th those leaders should probably think more about how are we gonna increase the capability of our team through sh creating a shared method of improvement, through creating aligned incentives. And then let's start, then we can start talking about the measures we're gonna hold them accountable to. Okay, so in, in what I'm hearing is, or I'm not making an assumption, 
that in your step five, the the uh, improvement training is is generic and is applied the same across any project, or is it customized to the need of the learners? Oh, I hope we could customize it any way we can. Tracy, okay. you see that too with nursing too. I'm sure we've got yeah. to be able to yeah. customize it. Yeah. And what I, I mean, I think we're seeing talking to many Stanford <laughs> colleagues here. I think what I like that we have here is a lot of resources around what is that availability for the team? Where are they at with their knowledge and capabilities? And how do we shift our resources to support accordingly um, or direct towards the things like our right program or SALT program or ACES um, that I cohort that I'm in? So. It's important to customize. We're getting close to our time before we open it up for more general questions, although we appreciate the engagement here. Tracy, I'm going to move us forward to the last case and then we'll close. Um, the last case, and we'll go through this one quickly, but it's a, it's an important one. We titled it is recognition and reflection foundational to improvement capability. Basically, what we're asking are tenants 10 through 12 really bedrock? Do they really need to be there? Here's an example. A large operational department has successfully worked through tenants one through nine. Leaders have been chosen, improvement training is available, measures are clearly established, and they feel improvement is what they do and who they are. Why worry about tenants 10 through 12? If people aren't engaged and supported in improvement, aren't we now improvement capable? Um, the, the rest of the story on this one, guys, is the idea... Yes, if you get through one through nine, you could be like an improvement machine. You can be the, the, the front line feel capable, things are happening. But if you're not deliberately calculating the benefits of your improvement work or recognizing individuals and teams who realize it, and then having reflection on how that project year went before going to the next one, if you're missing those three, we find that people are improving for the sake of improvement. They're, they're improving because it feels good, it feels right, people feel engaged. But because they're not deliberately calculating the benefits and recognizing those that have done it and, and looking for opportunities to spread during reflection, it's just improving for the case of improvement, which still feels good. It does. It, it feels good to be in that stage, but it's not complete. Uh, one person even asked us in a prior presentation, they said, uh, so couldn't we further your metaphor and say one, two, three are the bedrock, and then four, five, six are like the, the fragmented layers, and then seven, eight, and nine are the getting into the topsoil, and then that. And Tracy and I talked about this and decided, no, it's all the bedrock, all 12. They, they, it really is. That's what we witnessed in our teams. So Don, Don hit it right on the head, right? This, this 10 through 12 are the secret sauce that, for that oh. long-term sustained engagement. Yeah, couldn't have said um, it better, yeah. yeah. So let's close, and then we'll just open it up for general questions. What we just want to say here at the end is, um, uh, like Tracy emphasized before, this is the take home, guys. These are ordinal. Do one at a time. They start at one and go through 12. First, who are the leaders in your area chosen to be the drummers of that dragon boat? When to paddle faster, when to paddle slower, when to start, stop, those kind of things. Second, is their training accessible, available and accessible for all different disciplines in your area? and have leaders shown that they're deliberate about choosing the method you're using. And then third here, measure driven priorities. Do you, do, are there measures? And is there a cadence to meeting where we exist, that, that, that where we go and review these measures? And then lastly, calculate the benefits and make sure you're, you have a place to, to recognize and reflect. So that's our presentation for you today. And we'd like to open it now up for any questions, comments, and anything else, thanks. Great, thank you, Jake and Tracy. Um, yes, please put any comments in the chat or just uh, unmute and ask a question, but I will get the question started. Um, super interesting talk. And I think these 10 tenants or these 12 tenants make a whole lot of sense. In your guys' experience, like what is the timeline to move from one to 12 to be successful? I could see it takes, could take a quite a while to build up these relationships, these programs, but are there any case examples of like, that's probably a good reasonable timeline to 
to like sell this to teams that are just starting this process? Yeah, well, you uh, you saw in at least one of the examples we shared, you know, there was eight weeks to set up a leader, the MA, <laughs> to lead the project, to actually see measurable wins um, and impact on our patients. And then on that 10th week, celebrating that wins uh, and calculating the benefits, recognizing that person's hard work and dedication. Um, so that's pretty quick. We've also seen, um, you know, in larger, complexer areas, maybe that there does take a longer time. But I think it's important for us to examine the why it takes a longer time is are there specific struggles around each of those uh, tenants? Love that, Tracy. I, I, I think it's interesting. I didn't even think about the ones that go really fast and some that go much slower. Uh, I would respond also, Sam, that so I work as an improvement partner for a number of different areas at Stanford for six or seven different school of medicine department service lines, SHC service lines at Stanford. And I've noticed like there's one right now where I am, I and the, the leaders I work with, we are focused on number one. We do not have an operational lead to oversee improvement work and we've got to have one. And so we're, that's, and that's take, taken many months. I, I, it's taken about six months so far actually to figure that one out. Are there's other there's other tenants in the working as we do that. We're thinking about what measures might be chosen and what this report out venue is going to look like. And we're trying a few things, but number one's key. And then there's other areas where um, I can think of one uh, where there we've got one through nine really, really well. And we're just starting with number um, 11. Individuals are recognized and outcomes are celebrated. It was very interesting, actually. So we went to this report out meeting and a project was closing. And we went to the, it was a quality council meeting. We went to the quality council meeting and the team member said, so my project is now closed. We didn't know how to react to that statement, guys. <laughs> no one did. <laughs> it was like, whoa, wait, a project's closed? What, what do we do now? It was, I remember that uh, one of the division chiefs reached out to me afterwards and said, Jake, what does that mean? Does that mean they don't meet anymore? Does that mean that we don't talk about this problem anymore? And I said, yeah, that's some of the things that it does mean, but it also means we should celebrate. And, and so that team ended up getting support to go out and, and have a dinner together and be recognized for their efforts. And I, so I agree 10, 11, and 12 are not ones that we get to very quickly, but at some point we should, but this can take years. It can take years to get there. Interesting. And in regards to, so uh, the Evaluation Sciences Unit loves implementation science frameworks. And within that, there's been a de-implementation uh, branch uh, creating. So when you, you're talking about closing projects, are you talking about like de-implementing something that's not working or looking at something that's like, this is sustainable? We'll, we're, ready like, to, we're ready to stop this project, which a project as defined as a temporary group of people coming together on something, not a not a perpetual group of people. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not de taking something away. It's saying the sun has now set it on this project, set it on this project, and now we're ready to move on to the next one. I think though, Sam, to, to your question, there is value in understanding how to apply this, these tenets too, in the implementing. Um, you know, I think there's still value in calculating the benefits or even maybe the cost, but then to recognize the efforts it was we took to implement, learn what we learned and make the, the deliberate decision to roll back. Yeah. And with that, how do you choose, though each project is so unique and different, and I imagine has very specific measures to look at success, how do you guide teams in selecting the right measures for them where it's measurable, available, and actually will uh, give you a signal on whether it's not it's working? 
Yeah, I, I think that question, Sam, actually goes into it. That's a, what we're talking about here is what's going behind the scenes for that project, not the specific project team and the measures they choose. Um, but we would hope that project teams are able to see connection to the measures as defined by their area. Um, but going to choose those measures for a project would, um, that's to us as kind of a separate discussion, but we appreciate the question. And Lisa put in the chat, do you have publication or uh, some type of manual on this topic? What do you think, Tracy? Should it be published? I don't know, guys. If there's, if there's a PI here that would, would like to work with us on publishing it, we'd be happy to. But no, it's not published right now. We've, but the slides will be provided. It's, we, we tried to make it... Um, it's almost like a checklist, guys. It's it's almost, it, 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 we tried to, there's so, when we found in the literature, there's all these models, these theories, these ideas on how to make an area of improvement capable. But when we pulled this group of 40 improvement professionals together, clinical and non-clinical, we talked about, can we make it something where you can walk into an area and almost just, does it have it or does it not? And, and it's hard to say improvement is that easy, but we, it's not but we do feel like these 12 capture a lot of the main things. Are there any questions from anyone else other than Sam? <laughs> I'll ask a question. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm very serious about you know, trying to publish this. Um, does this checklist in this form where you, Jake and Tracy, where you all have worked in units or with uh, physicians or councils, I mean, does it physically um, exist to where they, you know, it's not just theory, but it's it's actually a process they go through? Uh, no, there's not a, <laughs> a name somewhere. This is this is something that we believe any improvement professional should just know. And I mean, if you need to list it out and put it somewhere, that's fine. But it's, I hate for this. I think the, the, the minute this becomes a quality assurance, do you have this or not? It's become more of a weapon than it is a guide. And um, because there's, there's so much gray zone on how some, some these 12 things are applied that I think we've got to be careful on how we do that. But Lisa, I, I don't know. It's there's not no, there's not a checklist out there, but it's something we should know and understand. It's it's the framework I use when I go support a new area as I'm thinking about these 12 things. Well, um, I mean, you know, whether you publish or not, um, we can certainly put it as a tool on the website and and you know, and just call it a guide. Um, if you're struggling with your project, you know, this is a, a checklist that you might want to review and see if these foundational elements are in place. Um some people know I I uh, I help uh, the VA as a as a leader coach and oh my God you know they love they love dense decks <laughs> I was just looking at one respect for people forty slides later you know <laughs> every other slide is like a list of seven things related to. A culture of respect, you know, it's got diversity, equity, inclusion, civility, and authenticity. And like every time you go through something, they even take the word respect and they have something that goes with each letter of respect. So so I, I'm not I'm not saying go overboard like that, but you know, you guys have done this wonderful work. We'd love to help share it beyond this talk. Um, I will share that this, you know, being, you know, again, thanks to Jake for bringing me into this, it's really caused me to really reflect, reflect on some of the structures and how we achieve quality and nursing quality improvement. Um, so we're not there yet, but looking forward to um, enabling our leaders within my own department, many of them are here, and um, also with the nursing leaders outside there um, doing the clinical work. Any other questions? Okay. 
Well, thank you, Jake and Tracy, for all this hard work and a lot to think about as we're looking at our own systems and thinking what we might be missing. Um, yes, so, yep, remember to submit your publication to SMCI Publication Award um, and uh, the recording and the PDF of the slides will be available on SMCI's website soon. I'm looking at, I think Selena's the one that posts it, so I'm not sure of the timeline, but it'll be there and I'm for you to share with your colleagues. Okay, thank you everyone and have a good uh, afternoon. Bye, thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much.